I have two bells to start the meeting. One is my bell from Melly, so I call it my Melly Bell. So that is our official start. So welcome everyone. Um, a couple welcoming comments about today. Did you know that today is International Friendship Day? So say hello to a friend today. Today is also John Lewis's funeral. Um, and so when I think about our speaker and I think about the state of our country and the state of the world, I thought it would be good to share a quote that you've probably heard by now. Uh, never be afraid to make some noise. And that was per the late Congressman John Lewis, who was a civil rights icon, who passed away last weekend. And he tweeted that a few years back. The ending of that quote is, and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. So I leave those, with you, those words with you as we start our meeting today. And if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, your line will stay muted, but feel free to follow along. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you'd like, you could turn your um, presentation mode into speaker view. So if you, it will help you see the speakers more clearly and more polished and professional way. So in the top right hand corner of your screen, if it says speaker view, click it. If it says gallery view, there's no change you need to make. So with that, I'd like to introduce Carter Sales for the inspirational moment. So Carter is our Denver Rotary Club Foundation president. He is also sales and broker principal of Carter Sales Commercial Real Estate Services. So Carter, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Some time ago, I came across quotes from 100 years of Rotary international presidents. And so one that I think does fit in with the International Friendship Day is one uh, from Carlo uh, Revisa. He was from the Rotary Club of Milan, Italy. And his quote is, clearly, we are moving toward a future that will be characterized at once by desperate needs and vast potential. We Rotarians are especially well positioned to serve as a bridge between the problems and the possibilities. We have a strong presence in nations that are technology rich, as well as in countries that can barely meet even the most basic human needs. Let us use that presence and the unique perspective it affords us to create the vibrant spirit of Rotary and extend it to every part of our community and the globe. I thank you and Debbie, back to you. Thank you, that's very appropriate. Not only from the international aspect, but the, the past president aspect, which uh, our speaker is amongst that esteemed group. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Troy Szymanski. So Troy is our club secretary and is an investment counselor. Thank you, Debbie. Good early afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to start today with introducing our guests. First off, we have Mike Deneen's mother, Jan Deneen, is joining us. She's a visiting Rotarian from St. Louis. Also, we have Roger Poole, Joyce Rosenblum, Darlene Porter, Chris Beasley, who's a guest of Debbie Beasley, as well as Carolyn Schrader, who's a visiting Rotarian from the Mile High Club. Diane Messamore, who's also a visiting Rotarian, and Leslie Herman. Thanks all of you guys for joining us and any other guests that I wasn't able to mention. Next up, we have some birthdays. So happy birthday to Dick Metcalf and my sponsor and past Rotary president, Steve Mast. So happy birthday this week to those, those two. Send them your wishes. All right, and then finally, some announcements. Uh, as always, on Thursdays, we have our virtual happy hour. So look in an email uh, tonight 
uh, it'll be at 5.30. Uh, look in the, the email, uh, the Rotary Recap uh, email that'll come out later today should have the link for this. So if you're interested in joining us, 5.30, happy hour on Zoom. Uh, finally, some important dates. Save the date for Darlene's retirement party on Wednesday, August 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Scientific Sod Farm in Commerce City. Reservations are required for that, so check your emails for that as well. Peach Pickup Day is Saturday, September 12th from 8 a.m. to noon only at the Rotary Office parking lot. Don't forget to order your Colorado peaches. Apparently we have a, an end to one of the only ways to get them in Colorado this year. So definitely do that. Also on September, uh, Saturday, September 12th, so the same day as the peach pickup is the Woo Humanity Bike Challenge. So you don't have to ride to participate. And for more information, you can contact your team captain, Carter Sales. Debbie, that's all for me. All right, thank you very much, Troy. And next up, we have Lisa Gullias, and Lisa is our service team co-vice president, along with Mark Whipper. Lisa is a land specialist with Valor Enterprises, Inc., and she's going to tell us about a couple of fun volunteer things coming our way. Hi, everybody. I've got a couple of slides I want to share. Can I actually do that, Lauren? Give me just a second, Lisa. Okay. You're good to go. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday. Um, I am looking for volunteers. For everybody that is really tired of being at home, um, we need you. So there's just a list of volunteers over the next two months, August and September. This Sunday is Metro Caring Provisioning Project, and it's from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. This is helping our neighbor, the Denver Cherry Creek Rotary, who secured a warehouse um, to repackage bulk foods into individual portions. And this will be for the Metro Caring Food Bank. So masks are required, gloves will be provided on, you know, all of these volunteer opportunities are safe. Um, but join us, uh, this Sunday, Debbie Beasley and her husband, Chris, uh, Mark Whipper and myself, I registered for five people to help. So if somebody wants to join, please let me know. Or anybody that wants to register, here is my contact below. So let me know where they're doing this on a regular basis, weekly, and um, you can take a look at the calendar. Saturday, August 15th, this will be the first cleanup of 2020, the Cherry Creek Trail Cleanup. An email went out about this. So we need a really big turnout for this. Um, this will be an active socially distanced service project to clean up the Cherry Creek Trail from Glen Arm Place to Lawrence. Please, we do need some help on this one. Um, contact Andrew Walker. His contact number is below. If you want to jot that down real quick or his email. And email also went out about this. And just to back up Troy on this, on September 12th, both things are happening, but we need volunteers. We need volunteers for the peach sale on September 12th from eight to about noon. Um, Brian Geist, so here's his phone number, his email. Um, peaches are, you can order them now as, as Troy mentioned, but we also need a huge amount of help to help um, on this day. And then we've got the Woohoo Challenge. Also looking for not just members, but maybe if you want to ride. So you can ride 10 miles, 25, 50, 85, or 100 if you're really so inclined. Um, registration fees are pretty low, and you can you know, join this particular team that our own um, Carter Sales has put together. Or you can volunteer, of course, marshals, aid stations, sag wagon. And um, I'm going just to see him on his unicycle ride this 25 mile ride. So contact Carter um, if you want to join this. All right. Thank you. Back to you, Debbie. Thank you, Lisa. That is great. That is great. I didn't realize on the Woo Humanity you could also walk. So I learned something new. Thank you. All right. Um, you have met Carter Sales already. You've seen him on a unicycle through Lisa's slides. <clears throat> and now Carter's going to talk to us about good news buckets. Thank you, Debbie. 
this is the portion of our program where we share our good news and it's uh, a minimum donation to the Denver Rotary Club Foundation of $20. The way you do that is after the meeting with the meeting recap, you get the survey, but also if you scroll down on the meeting recap, you'll see a lot of pertinent information on today's meeting and then you can um, pay for your good news that way. So I will open it up for uh, good news and you can go down to your um, screen at the bottom and click um, on your participant screen. You can raise your hand and Lauren, if you can also help me with that or you can raise your hand in front of you. So however you wanna do it is perfectly acceptable. So who do we have? Good news. I am searching through some people that might have good news. No good news this week? There's gotta be somebody with good news. Okay, well, I'm a guest, but I'm Leslie Herman, and I'm the president of the Rotary Club of Tahoe Incline. I'm a native Coloradoan visiting my mother, and I have good news that I'll share with your club. I'd like to donate $50 to your club for hosting me today, and um, $50 total in honor of my mother. We're road tripping through Creed, Colorado, Mesa Verde National Park, Zion National Park, and through Great Basin National Park back mm -hmm. home to Tahoe. Oh, wonderful, Leslie. Thank you so much and welcome today. Tahoe, what a beautiful place in the world. My goodness gracious. It is. It was rough moving from Boulder, Colorado to Tahoe. I'll tell yeah, you. that's that's tough duty. I'll tell <laughs> yeah. you what, what a <laughs> great place. Well. well, welcome and we certainly appreciate your donation and our Denver Rotary Club Foundation, by the way, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. We're in our 51st year and we have over the life of this foundation have contributed eight over eight million dollars to a variety of charities and local and international projects so it certainly goes to a wonderful cause thank you so is there a link on your um on the notice to attend is that what you said so i can get there the will money. be a link on the follow-up lauren will i'll, I'll put it get... in the chat box for you right now leslie thank you lauren all right, thanks. I don't thanks Gary so Schrank has his hand up. I'm sorry? Gary Schrank has his hand up. Oh, okay. Well, I Very got good. some uh, news, but I, I think it's good news, but uh, sometimes I, I'm not sure. But uh, last week I actually retired uh, for the second time. Now, I don't know if that's a news thing, but it's news to me. So anyway, I have retired. Huh? So that's that's great, Gary, and I know you'll be busier in retirement probably <laughs> like most people are, which is a good thing. <laughs> Excellent. Hey. Thank you for that. Hey, Johnston. Hi, Chris. Oh, I see. I see Chris Beasley, who I met last week. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Hey, Johnston has her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say how excited I, I was when I finally got in touch with uh, Dr. Sylvia Whitlock, who's speaking to us today. And I also wanted to say I had a fabulous weekend up in Silverthorne with past president Jim Johnston and his family and his oh. three little kids. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim is a great guy. I I'm glad that you, you got to spend some time with him. <laughs> Pam Adams has her hand raised. <clears throat> Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Carter. Um, yeah, my, my good news is that Mindy and I and her sister um, are heading this weekend to the 80th annual Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. This will be Mindy's like 19th year in a row or so. And I think um, they uh, decided it doesn't matter if we cancel this, people are still going to come. So we're going to go as safely and conservatively as possible, but hopefully I'll be back in a couple of weeks to tell you, hey, all was, all was good. Hey, that's excellent. <clears throat> my, uh, my son-in-law is from Rapid City, so familiar with that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I see, I see Jill Santuccio's hand. I just wanted to expand upon the fact that I am in a very small window between summer school and starting fall semester of <clears throat> paralegal school. 
and I'm putting all of the lawyers in our club on notice <clears throat> that I am looking for an internship in the spring and that I'm also going to be reaching out to several of you um, directly for a little bit of career coaching. So if you get a random phone call from a 704 number, which is my old Charlotte phone number, um, please pick up because I need some coaching. I need to know what to do when I become a newly minted paralegal. And thank you to all of you for your incredible support um, as I've been undertaking this process over the last year and a half. Thank you, Jill. Allison Euler Mitch. Hi. Can you hear Hi. me? Okay. Yes, indeed. Um, so I'm excited. Um, a lot of you know that I opened um, a yoga studio the 1st of January. It hasn't gone exactly how I planned because, you know, who can plan for COVID? But um, I am going to be offering classes at Four Mile Historic Park starting next week outdoors where you can um, socially distance and you don't have to exercise with a mask on. And I know a lot of you are actually involved with Four Mile Historic Park. And um, if you are a member, you can take any of um, my classes there for $12, which is a really good deal. So it would be fun to see a few of your faces out there. Um, we're doing total body conditioning and yoga and some other fun stuff, some meditation. So that's my good news. <laughs> Trying to keep it going. Thanks, Allison. Thanks. That's excellent. Jim White. Well, Lauren, I, I saw Chris Beasley's hand up as well. Okay. Hi, Chris. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Or Lauren, can you unmute Chris? I might mute him again. No, just kidding. <laughs> you just go into the upper right. There you go. Just following up on uh, the gentleman who is retiring for the second time, my lovely wife, Debbie's last day of 36 years at Wells Fargo is this coming Monday. Wow. And she will also be busier in retirement than she was working when she was uh, doing the rotary things and working at the same time. Now it's just all rotary. Excellent. Congratulations, Debbie. Jim White. Great. You know that I've belonged to uh, Lakewood Country Club for 53 years now. Um, Lee passed away five months ago, and they've uh, Lakewood's been open during the whole pandemic, but in a safe way. But they're finally allowing guests. So uh, tomorrow, I'm taking my son-in-law out to play golf, and then uh, the rest of the family is coming over to the pool at six, and we're going to have some swimming and have some uh, burgers and stuff at the pool. So. Doesn't sound much like a uh, socially distanced thing, but they kind of do a pretty good job of it. So I'll be enjoying that and having a good time tomorrow. They're finally opening up the course and the pool for guests this week. Thank you, Jim. Excellent. Julie Freshman. You're on mute, Julie. Am I off mute now? Yep. Yes. Okay, so um, my daughters are moving to Philadelphia, and my uh, youngest daughter, as of today, just got a job offer. So um, they will both be gainfully employed, and I'm really proud of them. I'm really relieved for that. So that's it. That's my great news. That's good news. Excellent. Especially in this environment, gainfully yeah. employed is awesome. <laughs> Especially your kids, you know? That's all okay. I need, Carter. Okay, well, very good. Well, I, we'll conclude this session of good news. We thank everybody for your good news and certainly for your support of the Denver Rotary Club Foundation. And Debbie, I will turn it back to you. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Carter. Great. We're gonna we're trying to recruit Chris Beasley to join Woo Humanity. So we're uh, I sent him that information today. So excellent. Yeah. Okay, Fun. Chris. It's up to you, sir. Thank all you. right. Thank you, Carter, that was great. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Peg Johnston, who will introduce our speaker. So Peg, uh, it, speaking of International Friendship Day, is a dear friend to me. She's the polio chair and the program's co-chair. She's the retired principal of Business Acquisitions Limited. So Peg. Thank you, Debbie. 
three years ago at a, a Rotary Club of Golden polio fundraising program, which was celebrating women in Rotary, I saw and heard Dr. Whitlock speaking. And so now as we celebrate 100 years of women having the right to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, I thought it would be fun to hear from Dr. Whitlock about Rotary, the Supreme Court, and women. Dr. Sylvia Whitlock was born in New York City and attended high school in Kingston, Jamaica, where her grandmother lived. And once back in the US after high school, she earned a BA in psychology in New York and then worked for the United Nations in the Secretariat Building as a statistical clerk. Then moving to California, she earned a master's degree in education, a PhD cum laude in education, and a second master's degree in marriage, family, therapy, after which she became a therapist, which was her second career. Then when the Rotary Club of Duarte, California needed more members, they sought out community leaders and invited their local elementary school principal. Well, that principal was now Dr. Sylvia Whitlock on her third career. And now, Dr. Whitlock, please tell us the rest of the story. Thank you, Peg. Thank you for having me talk. It's always interesting to me because I, I never know. This happened 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. But there are always people who didn't know there was ever a problem with women being members of Rotary. Especially the new generation. They have no clue we're all in this. So I like to tell them, you know, we're, we're on the edge of tomorrow. And it used to be a tomorrow when we would see polio eradicated from the world. Now it's a tomorrow when we will see COVID-19 eradicated from the world, probably even more widespread than polio is right now. But polio is still moving away. You know, it's gone from Nigeria now, and there are only two places, Afghanistan and Pakistan, where we really worry about uh, polio. However, back in 1970s, I went to work in Duarte as a school principal. And as most school principals do, you worry about the community and the families in your community. And I remember talking with um, our superintendent about the families and their relationship with the school district. And he said, no need to worry about that. He said, we'll take care of it. Rotary is taking care of that. He said, you'll be invited to join Rotary. Well, I mean, Rotary? What is Rotary? I had never heard of Rotary. Uh, not an unusual thing. A lot of people have never heard of Rotary until they get invited to join. What I knew about Rotary then could have been loosely written on the head of a pen. I knew they were involved uh, with the school district in a in, uh, suit to get women to join. I knew about Kiwanis. Do you guys know about Kiwanis? You know what Kiwanis means? It means waiting to get into Rotary. Well, <laughs> so, thank you for your laugh, Jim. There was a Kiwanian person who told me that. But uh, I also knew about Elks because, I mean, I lived in New York City for a long time and you walk up and down 42nd Street and there are Elks in their uh, beautiful hats walking up and down the street and you know, and you say, who are those? And somebody says, oh, they're Elks. And you say, oh, okay, they're Elks. But I also knew about Lions because I was a school person and lions provide eyeglasses for the children in school. But I literally had never heard about Rotary until we learned about the struggle. So I'll tell you a little bit about the struggle, some of the funnier and more interesting experiences that I had. So Duarte is a little bedroom community about 20 miles east of Pasadena. The largest businesses in the community were the school district, Duarte Unified School District, and the City of Hope Cancer Hospital, a well-known cancer hospital. And here in this district was this small club uh, struggling, as we all do, to raise membership. Maybe not as, maybe your club doesn't struggle as much, you have a pretty large club. But we had maybe about 15 members, and so membership was an issue. And I want you to remember that because when Dick invited women to join, 
his focus was on membership and not on civil rights. That changed later on. So the year was 1976. And the superintendent of school, who really deserves all the credit for this action, he looked around his community and he saw all these manager types. If you remember, back then in the 70s, Rotarians were all manager types, CEOs. I was a principal, a reporter, a psychologist, perfect for, you know, for rounding out our rotary classification system. But they were all women. And Richard had never seen any women members in Rotary. But he thought, why not invite these women to join Rotary? So he went and he checked with the district governor and he confided his plan and what he thought. And the district governor, whom I will not name because he didn't pass the four-way test, said, yay, I think that's a pretty good idea, but I tell you what you do. When you register these women, make sure you don't use their full first names. Just use their initials. This way, nobody will question anything. And that's what he did. Well, the action was not without its dissenters. There was one person in the club who said he could foresee the death of the club. And he was well positioned to recognize death because he was the undertaker in the club. And so he resigned. And when he left, the undertaker classification was open. However, the women joined the club and they entered wholeheartedly into the spirit and the work of Rotary. You know, they had yard sales, snow cones for the city picnic, breakfast with Santa Claus, breakfast with the Easter Bunny, Thanksgiving baskets for needy families, all the things that Rotarians do, dinner for cancer survivors. But they also got busy planning their first event, which was the 25th anniversary of the club. And as usually happens, the celebration was set, everything was in place, and the international representatives were dispatched to Duarte to help the clubs observe that anniversary. Big milestone. So at the festivities, with all the representatives there, the women were introduced to the palpable consternation of the international <laughs> representatives. Well, it was obvious. The representatives returned to Evanston after the party was over and they reported, can you imagine, there were women in the Duarte Club. Well, headquarters lost no time in notifying Duarte that number one, women not allowed in Rotary. Number two, the women needed to be asked to leave. And number three, if the women didn't leave, they had to stop calling themselves a Rotary Club because there were no women in Rotary. Well, the club asked, can we appeal this? Can we talk to the board of directors about this? And it was told by International that you had to be a real Rotary Club to appeal to the board of directors. And as long as the women were there, they couldn't be a Rotary Club. Well, they asked if they could appeal to the Council on Legislation. And it was meeting that year in Tokyo. So one member, Luke McJimson, he was principal at the junior high school, and we called him Mr. Rotary. He was a long time Rotarian. He was chosen to take the issue to Tokyo. Well, it was an interesting situation, however, because when the issue came up for consideration, it wasn't whether the women should be permitted to be members, but it was whether the Rotary Club of Duarte had violated Rotary bylaws by inviting women as members. And of course they had. The answer was clear. The die was cast. The vote against having their club retain its women was 1,000 to 34. There were 34 delegates, imagine, 34 delegates who were sympathetic to the issue. And I met one of them in Calgary in the late 80s. We, the convention was in Calgary. It was a real convention, not a virtual convention. And we were on the train riding to the convention center. And sitting across from me in the car were a man and his wife. And they were both wearing tags. You could identify as rotary tags, and so was I. And the gentleman looked 
at my tag and he said, are you from the club that invited women to Rotary? And I was really excited and I got very excited. And I said, yes, we are the ones who invited women to Rotary and here we are. And he said, you know, I was at the convention in Tokyo and I voted to have women there because I always thought they should be there. And his wife, his sweet wife, sitting right next to him said, I didn't think so then and I don't think so now. And I said, why? And she said, because we have our husbands going out to meetings at night and I don't know how we feel about them meeting with women in these clubs. And I explained to her that it was not a social club, it was a service club and we did really worthwhile work, but she wasn't interested. Well, you know, Here's a little bit of information. In the 1950s in Detroit, a club in India had put an item on the bylaws, an item to change the bylaws on the agenda, and it was defeated. And the club went away. Years later, I would confront a group in India where they were trying to get women in the club and the women were reluctant to come in. However, back in the 1950s, the India Club just went away. But even more interesting, the first Rotary Constitution didn't specify that Rotarians had to be men. It just said persons of good character. But that was a time when there were few women in the workaday world. And because men were the ones engaging in fellowship and business activities, the bylaws just kind of morphed into men of good character. If I could ask Paul Harris a question today, it would be, would you have intentionally excluded women from Rotary? I went to the Paul Harris room in Evanston and there in his room is this larger than life Paul Harris figure. And I asked him, I said, would you have excluded women from Rotary? And he didn't say a word. Well, okay. Jack Davis, who was president when all this was going on, said, the unity of Rotary International was jeopardized by the unilateral move of the Duarte Club. And so they sent someone to Duarte to remove the charter of the club. He came to a meeting at our coffee shop and he said, you need to turn in your charter. As long as there are women here, you're no longer a member of the club. And we had to turn in our charter. So we turned in our charter. And Bill Brooks, who worked at City of Hope said, I know what we'll do, that's all right, we'll continue, but we'll just put an X over the Rotary icon and we'll name ourselves the X Rotary Club of Duarte. And if you can see that pin, that's our pin. And that was our pin for 11 years, a Rotary pin with an X over it. We became the X Rotary Club of Duarte. Well, as we talked about it, as they talked about it, a Rotarian from a neighboring club, from the Arcadia Club, Sanford Smith said, you know, I think we can take this to the court. I mean, these are women in a service club. We, we can take this to the court. And so we gave notice to Rotary that we were going to take it to California courts. And of course, Rotary said, you know what? All members of the board of directors aren't Californians. So they petitioned to have it taken to federal court. But the reason for that was because, see, there had been a precedent in federal court where a New York club had been seeking exclusionary rights for private club membership. And the federal court had ruled that the case should be heard in a California court. That's where we went. We weren't hanging on to that uh, precedent because it was ruled that it be heard in the California court. So it first, was first heard by the California Superior Court, which to our disappointment, upheld Rotary's right to expel the club. This was our first shock. Once we thought women in a service club, this is a, you know, that's a done deal. That's gonna be okay. But the court, the Superior Court said no. So we had to regroup and we had to rethink this whole issue. Remember I said, this was a membership issue. Actually, it was more than a membership issue. 
And so Sanford did some homework and found out that in California, we have an act called the UNRU Act. You probably have similar acts there in Colorado uh, where discrimination is banned in public accommodations. And Rotary was considered a public accommodation because of its classification system and because 80, at that time, 80% of the members had their dues paid by their employers. So Stanford did all his homework. He was assisted by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and he, the, we appealed the case to the California Appellate Court. And that California Appellate Court reversed the ruling of the Superior Court. But Rotary wasn't going to sit still with this. When they were, on, when they were informed, Rotary immediately appealed to the California Supreme Court, but that court refused to hear the case, essentially affirming the decision of the appellate court. But remember now that decision was incumbent on all California clubs, but only California clubs. This was a California appellate court. And so we moved on. And I like to tell people, before women, things changed very slowly in Rotary. And this was the year in which I was coming in as a president. And so I was invited, as all presidents are, to attend PETS. But I was sent the usual postcard that they sent to all their incoming presidents. And it said, we want you to make sure you bring your coat and tie because we'll be taking directory pictures. Well, you know, so I got a coat and tie, went and had my picture taken for the directory. But here at PETS, I was the only woman among 290 men, wonderful men that were very kind and cordial and courteous, and were really interested in what we were doing to get women in Rotary, because no doubt there were many clubs there, probably just as many as women, who were interested in getting women in Rotary. But I like to tell people that with 290 men and one woman, the nicest thing about that configuration was that restroom time. That restroom time here with 290 men lining up for the men's restroom. And I could just kind of sashay past into the ladies' restroom. And it was 30 years ago, I could still sashay right into the ladies' restroom. But there wasn't even one female speaker at that uh, at that pet. And at the section on Rotary International, I heard our incoming governor discuss the case and tell us that Rotary International will appeal to the United States Supreme Court, and we have every reason to believe we will win. Now, you know, I'm a school teacher, I'm a school principal, and it didn't seem to me that the Supreme Court would be interested and women in a service club. But again, I was overlooking the fact that this was a huge civil rights issue. It was not just a membership issue. I mean, I knew about the Supreme Court and, and you know, Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, or Roe versus Wade, but Duarte versus Rotary International, I wasn't sure about that. But you know what? It was a civil rights case. And of course, they did appeal to the United States Supreme Court. They thought they would win. And they said, hey, it's just the case of a little club making a big noise. It's the mouse that roared. And so we became, on our banner, the mouse that roared. And we even made a little mouse pin with an icon, with a rotary icon on his back. And I went back to Duarte and we had our new banner and we were the mouse that roared. Well, of course, I didn't think in 1987 anybody would have been appealing to your Supreme Court. And I keep thinking, for 11 years, there were Rotarians in Evanston who never changed their opinion about having women in Rotary. And I thought, if these Rotarians had daughters or even sons who were growing up, if they started out being 10, 11, or 12 years old, by the time this was over, there were adults 
22, 23 years old. And were you concerned about the kind of world you were preparing for these young people who were growing up, where women were not considered to be good enough, smart enough, to be in a service club that was doing community service? Well, I don't know. They did appeal, and the U.S. Supreme Court did take the case. R.I.'s argument was that the ruling violated their First Amendment right of association. They said, you know, the club in Duarte is just forcing, forcing us to take everybody in, just like a motel. That's a common expression, just like a motel. But <laughs> they used their First Amendment right of association. The Supreme Court did take the case, and it took them only four months to deal with that. On May the 4th, 1987, they found that considering the size, purpose, selectivity, and exclusivity of Rotary's membership, the relationship among the club's members was not of the intimate or private variety that warranted First Amendment protection. So writing for the unanimous court, Sandra Day O'Connor didn't vote because her husband was a Rotarian, but Justice Powell argued that many of Rotary's activities including their meetings, are conducted in the presence of strangers. And because women members would not prevent the club from carrying out its purposes, there was no violation of associational rights. And this perfect end to that paragraph, he said, furthermore, even if there were a slight encroachment on the rights of Rotarians to associate, that minimal infringement would be justified since it serves the state's compelling interest in ending sexual discrimination, gender discrimination. There it was. And the decision was now incumbent in all USA clubs. So I was driving to my job as principal of the school when the news came over the airwaves. And I remember we were in California and this came over the airwaves in um, New York City. So by the time I arrived at school, all the media were sitting out in front of the school. And Mary Lou Elliott and I, she was the first woman who went into a meeting and I were invited into the superintendent's office and we were interviewed by our CBS newscaster at the time, Warren Only. And I was asked, because I was the incoming president, many questions to which I thought I gave studied and intelligent answers. But near the end of the interview, in fact, we were already on our feet, I was asked how I got selected to be president. Well. <laughs> you ask a Rotarian that and you get the Rotary answer. So in a careless and decidedly unstudied moment, I said, oh, I don't know. I must have missed the meeting. Well, I wish I could have taken that back. That evening, the story was the top of the news, the first item on the news, including my inane and embarrassing response. And there are probably people out there I, I started to learn then of the capriciousness of the media, and I knew that I was going to have to adopt a more serious mode so that the people out there watching this didn't think, for 11 years we waited for this? Well, that was it. Well, back at the club, we had to move our meeting place because people came from everywhere. Uh, we had a lot of phone calls asking uh, if the food were any better now that we were in Rotary, you know, I explained we weren't cooking. Um, some were not as pleasant. We didn't get a welcome back from Rotary, but we did get a new due schedule, so we knew they knew that we knew. Anyhow, in 1989, two years later, uh, Frank Devlin, who recently died, made an impassioned speech at the Council of Legislation, which then voted to accept women members into Rotary, and now it was incumbent on all Rotarians everywhere. But it wasn't until April 2004 2004, that the Rotarian printed some articles about women in Rotary. And then I like to tell people I was the centerfold. Well, I was centerfold, full addressed. I was wearing a black turtle, like I was advised to wear a black turtle back. And I, that's how the interview was conducted. But Rotary has removed, finally, the last vestiges of sexist language, so that now they profit most who serve the best. And even more new, a club may not be chartered or legislative membership is open, the operative word is open, open to both men and women. 
This didn't start as a woman's issue, but as a simple attempt to recruit more members into Rotary. How successful has that been? Can men and women work together for Rotary? They have for more than 30 years. 30% 30 about of the women in the, of the Rotarians in the United States are women. It's a smaller percentage around the world. But that was the beginning of, beginning of my journey through the humanitarian organization that is Rotary. The realization of the opportunity to serve in an ever shrinking world, the opportunity to meet men and women who can see and articulate a need and a solution, no matter how difficult the need or how meager the resources. You know, President Madri Yagbe said, women serve alongside men in every segment of life, in education, in medicine, in warehouses, and in construction. Why not in Rotary? So I was in an incredibly fortunate place when it happened because it's brought such value into my life. And we have gone on to do many things in Rotary. I think I am running out of time and I need to leave some time for questions. So I will. There's also a book, if you can see it. Women also serve. I was asked to write this book because most of the participants in the case died. So if anybody's interested, you write to me. They, all the proceeds go to the Rotary Foundation for $20. You can get an autographed copy of the book. It's called Women Also Serve. Not Women Also Serve. Women Also Serve. Okay. Thank you for listening. And I'll try to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitlock. That was just absolutely inspiring to me. Um, I will well, let's open it up for questions. You can either raise your hand through the reactions button or through the participants, or you can put your question in the chat, either privately to me or to everyone, and I'll, I'll uh, run through them. Let me see if I see any, anybody have any questions? Let me see if I can see anything. Looking for <clears throat> any questions? Do I hear someone? Oh, I hear, I see Jim's hand up, Jim Wilshire. Let me take you off mute, Jim. Hold on. Okay. You look good. You're, yes, you're good now. Good. Uh, Jim is muted. Dr. Sylvia, <laughs> I would like to ask, oh, uh, okay. I'm sorry, uh, did you have uh, strong reservations uh, after you have gone through all of this of uh, making uh, yourself the uh, person really ahead of uh, uh, your club and leading that through? Uh, I know you must have uh, gotten some uh, number of comments about exactly how good it was that you were going to be in, in the, the club, etc. So I was delighted with your, uh, your position. Uh, it's interesting, Jim, that um, talking to clubs maybe 10 times a month about Rotary wasn't in my list of things that I thought Rotarians did. Okay. <laughs> But it's what I've had to do. But if it inspires people to join Rotary, if it makes a difference to get women in Rotary, hey, I will gladly do it. And that's what I have done. Uh, uh, Rotary has allowed me to do the things that I need to do to feel like a whole person. And so that's what I continue to do. Well, my wife uh, left for a doctor's appointment about 10 minutes or so left with yours. And uh, uh, I know she'll have a, a huge kick out of uh, watching the rest of your program today. So uh, thank you. Jim. That thank is, uh, yes, a, a, an important part of her life. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's an important part of my life. It's probably 80% of my life right now. <laughs> I, I also see Leslie Herman. You've got your hand up. I did. Um, hi, Dr. Whitlock. I'm actually visiting today. I'm the president of the Rotary Club of Tahoe Incline, 
And I just wanted to thank you um, from you know, woman to woman for forging the way for all of us. Um, I'm, a real, I'm also a, high, a school principal and I uh, just recently retired, but I, I just wanna thank you for uh, paving the way for us. Um, that's really amazing to get to meet you and I'd love to have you come visit our club. I'm trying to find out how to get a hold of you. So thank okay. you. We're, we're commit. Okay, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting that principals do so many jobs that they have to do well yet they weren't deemed capable of being Rotarians. And the person who really needs to be applauded for this was the superintendent of schools, the gentleman whose idea it was to invite him. Unfortunately, he passed away many, many, many years ago, but he would have loved to have seen the interest there is now in something that he did, something that he started, women and women. Well, and I think it's so, it's hard to get educators actually to be part of Rotary um, just because of the time commitment. And sometimes we just can't make the meetings because there's so many hours involved in, in work, but um, it's really been an enriching piece of my life. And we are the education club in our community. So I just want to, it's a real pleasure to meet you. So thank you so much. And I'm really glad I jumped on today. You're welcome. And our club, by the way, has more educators than anybody else in it. Oh, great. I'll have to- a town also. Are you in Arcadia, California? Oh, we're in Claremont, California. I'm in oh, Claremont. you're in Claremont. Okay, great. In Claremont Colleges. But we have all the high school principals and superintendent and everybody else, in addition to all the college people. Well, but we changed. we changed our meetings, by the way, to noon so that we could have uh, school people come at lunchtime. That's because great. We were in the morning and it was not a good time. Right. Oh, that's excellent. Yes, that's that's uh, something I'm hoping to do is to actually create a satellite club for our uh, yeah. teachers to join in by Zoom. So thank you. That's a great idea. And you're you're at the Claremont Club. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, a question from Seth Patterson. I've been going over notes from the July 28th, 2020 executive board meeting, and here are the takeaways. There is a lot of fear and concern about revenue with limited opportunity to have in-person events, a traditional source of approximately one third of our revenue. Many ideas on how to do things like increased phone calling, using a new online program, hiring a commission-based salesperson and moving to subscription-based dues, but little offering on new ideas to generate income. Hey, Mike, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I sent you a later text. Okay. How a, a copy of an email got copied into that text that is totally irrelevant to this. Okay. <laughs> well, I was uh, wondering where it was going. You know, uh, Debbie, right. Go you know, ahead. Debbie, uh, Debbie, are you listening? Yes. yes. I sent, I actually sent a challenge to my club because now that we're meeting on Zoom, we save $25 every Friday that we're not spending for lunch. And we suggested that we root that $25 into some worthwhile venture that we want to do and not just let it go away because it'll go away. You don't spend it, it goes away. And, and for a lot of us, that income is still there, but we need to put it someplace where it will do some work. In the heart of, in the heart of Seth, question is really in view of your experiences and on this day of John Lewis's funeral, what advice do you have for those groups still experiencing discrimination in the U.S. today? What kind of discrimination? <laughs> Are we talking about discrimination against women? Any or discrimination, of. you know, women. I, I, I should. I need to do my. I need to do my discrimination uh, one for you. I have a DEI uh, speech where we talk about. Some of you remember um, South Pacific, and you remember the theme behind South Pacific. And there was a song in that uh, uh, play called "You've Got to Be Careful and Taught." And a lot of us are taught when we're little and when we're young. And until we start to think for ourselves and look at how we look at the world and look at things that are happening in the world, we're never going to change. We need to look inside ourselves and see what it is we want to be. Thank you. 
And let's see, Peg Johnston. What have you done in Rotary since this? Since when? <laughs> I, since the Supreme Court ruling or yeah. recently? Well, right? well, I've done everything I could do at a club level. I've also been district governor. I've also been the person who, uh, 11 years I did GSE, uh, the, the four-way test competition. We do, I do Rotary Foundation. Any job that you can do in Rotary, I've probably done. You might also want to mention the, the uh, university in India, the, our school in India yeah. that you support. Yeah, Peg, and thank you, Peg, for that. I, I didn't get to that because I didn't have enough time for that. When I was um, getting ready to be district governor, I read a book called uh, Half the Sky, uh, a book written about victimization of women in the world. And I remember looking for something I could do that addressed some of the things that I saw. And at that time, Deepa Willingham was starting a school in India, a school for girls in Bengal State, in India, so girls who had never gone to school. I mean, girls 11, 12 years old who had never been to school. And so uh, we have, governors have a pet project in my district, and my district raised $90,000, and we built a school in Piali that housed 200 girls uh, from, from preschool all the way up to about what we would consider eighth grade. And I go every year, I, I was just there this past February, I go every year and I do workshops for the teachers because that's what I do. I do workshops to help teachers teach. They teach in Bengali and in English. And uh, there are 200 girls in the school and they're doing wonderful in their uh, examinations and so on. And that, that for me is, is my life. That school you know, they're locked down like everybody else around the world, but also they just had a cyclone which did a lot of destruction right there at the school. The building is okay, but the grounds need a lot of help. So, and the girls, because a lot of them lost their homes, uh, the school and the Rotary Club of uh, Calcutta Metropolitan provides food and sustenance for those kids, and they distribute that every week so that the kids are not just left hanging out. So that school is my pet project, and, and Peg um, made a contribution to that school. Usually, when I, when I go places and people say, what can we do? What can we give you? I usually say, don't buy me anything. Just send stuff to the school. So. Well, we'll close it with one last question. There's a similar theme here about recruiting new members and diversifying membership, um, specifically about women because of your speech, but also I think just in general, as we look to be a better representation of our community. Any thoughts on how to improve recruiting or generate members? We need to really look at the new generations and look at the young people and get, you know, they have ways of conducting rotary meetings that we never thought of. I mean, they have them in a bar and they have a beer and a pizza instead of a chicken dinner. <laughs> yeah, typical of what we think. But but they know and they're they're communicative, they know how to do social media, they know how to connect. And then once you get them, we need to hook them up. Older members, newer members, not necessarily age, but people who have all the information about Rotary with new people who are coming in so they can transfer. Those young people can tell the people who've been there for years how to do things. They can. You just need to listen. You know, and then they will draw in other people. I mean, we have projects, you know, we're turning cell phones, we're turning this, we're turning that. things that we never thought of doing, you know, uh, as Rotarians who are, have been there for a while. So I think look at young people, look at young people. They have all the energy that you need to have them focus on the Rotary Club. And they would love to talk to you if you talk to them. Don't talk at them and don't talk down to them. Talk with them. They have a lot of information that you can use and you have a lot of information that will help them. Just remember that. So. Well, thank you. Three weeks ago, I gave my president's message and put it in a, a communication also to the club about standing on the shoulders of giants of the past presidents of this club, but it's also of people like you, Dr. Whitlock. And so thank you very much. 
I'm well, I thank you for that. I don't feel like much of a giant. I feel as if I gained more than I ever gave to Rotary. Well, in appreciation of your, your speaking with us today, we've made a donation to Polio Plus to inoculate 33 children. And with the match from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as you know, we'll, we'll be able to inoculate 100 children against polio. And I'm so happy to see that Nigeria has now dropped off the list. Right, I saw that. Interesting. Very, that's big. All right, with that, um, I would like to close us out and announce next week's online program. Also an exciting program. It is on Unconscious Bias by Dr. Regina Lewis, Department Chair. And I've seen her speak before. She is fabulous. So please join us next week. And we'll conclude with the four-way test. So please join me as I lead us on the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? With that, we are adjourned and I'll whack the official bell. Thank you, everybody.